The first Grand Prix of the year is now over, but the question is, what did we actually learn from the Bahrain Grand Prix, other than, well, Max Verstappen and Red Bull are currently in a different league? Well, actually, there's a lot of interesting points to take away from the first race of the year, and today we're going to be doing just that. Can Ferrari fight back? Are Aston really the second fastest car? Well, let's find out. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more. The vast majority of viewers are not currently subscribed to the channel, and if you're one of those, I would greatly appreciate if you just tapped that little subscribe button for more F1 content. Now, let's get to the video. Let's start with a team who had unquestionably the worst weekend of any team, and that was McLaren. McLaren's race in Bahrain was an absolute disaster class, and one to forget. Reliability-wise, the McLaren was actually the least reliable car out there, with one car not making it very far into the race with Piastri, and for Norris, well, he didn't make it far into the race either before he had to pit due to having an issue with the hydraulics. That needed him stopping multiple times. This led to Norris hitting the unheard of six stop strategy and unsurprisingly, the six stop strategy was not ideal for McLaren. When they were working, the car did seem okay, but certainly it is not where a team like McLaren should be. Norris's highlight was that he spent a few laps battling Ocon for the wooden spoon. He did get past Ocon, but let's be honest, it was not great. And speaking of Ocon, Alpine also had a race to forget for one of their cars. I remember saying in my video about the new order of competitiveness that Alpine and McLaren would be much further behind than they were last year. And well, for Ocon and the McLaren duo, they absolutely had a shocking race. Ocon's race only lasted 43 laps, but in those 43 laps he managed to secure three penalties. The first penalty was for being out of position in his pit box, then he got a second penalty for speeding in the pit lane, and then at the same time he got his third penalty, because when he did serve his first penalty, his team didn't serve the full penalty. The team started working on his car before the five seconds was up, so he copped another penalty. On lap 43, Alpine opted to retire Ocon's car, but as for his teammate Gasly, Gasly actually had a great race, and was on average the fourth fastest car all race long, which is wild given that he started the race at the back of the grid. But why is this? The reason for this is essentially that Gasly spent a lot of the race on his own, and racing in clear air. He did this because Gasly stopped early for his first stop, which gave him the undercut and then gave him a chance to drive around much faster than the competition, but on his own. When the rest of the field made their first stop, Gassi was able to jump up ahead of a lot of the other drivers, and then he was still in clear air and was still able to be out on his own. This can be seen by the graph on your screen. As you can see, most of the time when Gasly makes up places, he's actually making multiple places instead of just one. Why is this? The main reason is, of course, the cars in front of him are making their pit stops, so he gains a free position. Mixing this with the fact that Gasly did a three-stop strategy, you can see why he had the fourth best race pace out of anyone in the field. Last thing on Alpine that I will say, though, is they had a much better car than I anticipated. Gasly being fourth fastest, mixing with Ocon actually qualifying in the top 10, tells me that yes, Alpine does have a better car than testing indicated. One car that surprised me with how much they struggled in the Grand Prix was the Haas car. It seemed like for Haas, they would actually have a decent result. At least I thought that before the Grand Prix, but when the race got underway, it was pretty clear that Haas were going to struggle. Magnussen started towards the back of the field and opted to start on the hard compound tyres, and early on it was pretty clear he was not enjoying being on those tyres. As for his teammate Hulkenberg, he starts at P10, which I thought was going to be great, but he didn't spend very long there, as he sunk like a stone towards the back of the field, and the Haas car just seemed to struggle on their tyres with tyre wear. Both drivers opted to do a three-stop strategy, and honestly for Haas, it had a feeling of the 2019 Haas, where they would be okay in qualifying, but then when the race starts, they would have absolutely zero pace and would drop down due to high tyre wear. If this is the case, they will need to get on top of these issues very quickly, otherwise 2023 could be a season to forget for them. Finally, for the slower cars, the slowest car in the field was the Alpha Tauri. For me, this was not a huge surprise. I did predict that they would be the slowest car after testing, and well, it seems that at least right now, they are living up to that. Two drivers who don't exactly set the world on fire, and a team which has rumours of being sold, 
doesn't exactly exude confidence, and that lack of confidence is sadly showing out on track. Hopefully, we can see a little bit of improvement from Alpha Tauri. But that being said, Sonoda was very close to scoring some points on race one. But enough with the negativity, let's get to some of the more positives from the Grand Prix. And don't worry, I will be getting around to Aston Martin, Mercedes and Ferrari very soon. So stick around for that. Also, just a reminder, all of these graphs are brought to you by F1 Data Analysis. Check them out on Twitter and also their Buy Me A Coffee. Now, let's get to one of the big positive surprises from the race, and that was the Williams team. Now, I recently stated that Williams may not have the most advanced race car on the grid, but they do have a very tidy race car, and it seems like that is very much the case. Both Alex Albon and Logan Sargent had a respectable pace during the Grand Prix, and Albon managed to score points in the very first race of the year, which came to a surprise to a lot of people. But why were they there, and why were Williams able to score points? Well, the reason for this that I believe is Williams were actually pretty handy on their tyres. They did make a free stop work like the majority of the field, but the reason for this three stop was due to the safety car, and I think they could have very easily made a two stop work. Albon was defending for his life against Yuki Tsunoda for that last point, and I think that one point will be very important for Williams in their fight against Alpha Tauri, as I don't see both teams scoring many points this year. But yeah, for Williams, they had respectable pace, and it did seem like during the Grand Prix, Williams was able to move forward. And the reason for this is because, like I said, Williams seem to be pretty good on their tyres, which is going to be very important for them at the early stages of this year. Now let's get to the main part of the video and pretty much what you've all been waiting for, and that is what's going on between Mercedes, Aston Martin, Ferrari, and the very dominant Red Bull, and why I think, sadly, Red Bull are in for a very dominant season after Bahrain. Firstly, let's talk about outright pace. Something which was a bit of a shock to the system, in my opinion, was just how far behind the Mercedes car was when compared to the Ferrari and Aston Martin, especially when on the soft compound tyres. Last year, Mercedes was probably the best car in the field when it came to tyre wear. We saw that at races such as the Dutch Grand Prix, Mercedes were able to run much longer and suffer with a lot less tyre wear. But... In Bahrain, Mercedes was seemingly one of the teams that were struggling a lot more with tyre degradation. This graph shows that the lap time between the top four teams went on the soft tyres and also on the hard tyres. And what does the graph tell us? Well, what it tells us is actually really interesting. Mercedes started out on the soft stint faster than the Aston Martin. But as the stint wears on, you can see that actually Aston Martin overtakes Mercedes. And we could see that during the Grand Prix, when Alonso at the start of the stint was actually behind both Mercedes. He, of course, had a bad start and fell behind both Mercedes cars, and he was losing time early on in the Grand Prix, but as the stint wore on, he was able to close down and close that gap to George Russell, and then later on in the race, he was able to overtake George Russell, and then later on in the Grand Prix from there, he was able to overtake Lewis Hamilton as well with some excellent wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. So Aston Martin had much better tyre wear than the Mercedes. As for Ferrari, it seems that on the soft tyres, Ferrari suffered similar deg to Mercedes. However, they were faster than Mercedes throughout that entire time. So they had similar deg, but they were able to maintain that faster pace to Mercedes. However, on the harder compound tyre, Ferrari struggled a lot more when compared to the Mercedes and was actually slower than both Mercedes and Aston Martin, which I think is very, very interesting. Last year, Ferrari could fire the tyres up really quickly, so they were typically better on the harder tyres. But this year, it seems like they struggled on those harder tyres and maybe they couldn't fire them up just as quickly as they could do last year. That will be an interesting thing to see as the races progress. On the other hand, hard tyres for Aston Martin were perfect for them. Aston Martin were the closest team to Red Bull on the hardest compound tyres, which is astonishing. But maybe it shouldn't be a surprise because, as we saw from practice, the stopping power of the Aston Martin is arguably the best in the field. But what about Red Bull? Well, this is where things get very scary for the competition. Red Bull was significantly faster than their rivals on the softer compound tyres, and not only were they significantly faster, but they were also suffering with less tyre wear. This graph shows us that Red Bull's line is not as steep as the competitions, which means that they were able to sustain a faster pace 
for a longer period of time so that they were not only faster, but they were more consistent, which tells me Red Bull was holding back on those soft compound of tyres. Red Bull was also the only team that could manage a soft, soft, hard strategy as their rivals all did soft, hard, hard. And that is terrifying for the rest of the field for the rest of the year. Red Bull are in a very, very strong position. So what did we actually learn from the fastest teams? Well, right now, Ferrari is the second fastest team with Charles Leclerc. But sadly for them, it doesn't seem like that's the case for Carlos Sainz as Sainz is struggling with pace versus Charles Leclerc. However, reliability has already reared its ugly head once again for Ferrari as Charles Leclerc broke down and he's already on his second energy store for the year. And of course, they only get two energy stores for a full season, meaning that power unit penalties will be coming sooner rather than later for Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari. That being said, Saudi should suit Ferrari better as it is a high speed circuit and that is where Ferrari, at least right now, seem the strongest. Aston Martin have a brilliant race car on their hands. They have a brilliant car on the brakes and they have a great car when it comes to tyre wear. But sadly for them, I don't think that's actually going to help them when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Because as we saw last year in the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, Saudi Arabia was a very high speed circuit and tyre wear was actually very low as all the cars did a one stop last season. For Mercedes, I'm still a little bit unsure what to expect from them. They have work to do, but maybe, just maybe, things will be a little bit better for them in Saudi Arabia, at least when they're against the Aston Martin. But I don't think Mercedes will be as fast as the Ferrari, and I certainly don't think Mercedes will be anywhere near the Red Bull team. Because, let's be honest, Red Bull could just turn up to Saudi Arabia, and they'll probably dominate the Grand Prix. But that is what I think. The question is though, what do you think? What were your main takeaways from the Bahrain Grand Prix? And once again, a huge thank you to F1 Data Analysis for letting me use the graphs that they produce. And you guys should definitely check out their Twitter account. And as always, comment, leave a like, and subscribe for more F1 content. And thank you all so much for watching.